وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين وسلم التسليم الكثيرة أما بعد We continue 7.20 p.m. Friday, February the 1st <coughs> which is the 26th night of Jumad al-Ula 1440 1440 at the Hijrah Mustafa alayhi salatu wassalam commercials on your app huh? but we say uh, what you'll find that the great imam if we go back to the chapter we finished them or actually we're in the midst of the masail of the issues or the matters that were mentioned the last part of the chapter we stopped at where it said al-khamis al-khamisa ana dhalika kulli nazju al-haqi bil-baatil as we finish that, it's the fifth matter that the reason for that, all of it, is mis- mixing the truth with falsehood. So he said, for first, the first was love of the righteous, which is true, which is a type of what? Haq, it's a type of truth. <coughs> he said, and, second, and secondly, the action of people from Ahl Ilm, the people of knowledge and religion. Them doing something in which they intended by it good. I saw those who came after, after them, do you find that they what? Annahum aradu bihi ghayra. Even though they were the ones who set something or laid something down as a foundation and they intended by it good, but those who came after, they intended something other than that. Other than that good, what was intended by those who preceded them. So you find, like we said, the, r- the love of the righteous <coughs> was the reason for them falling into this falsehood or falling into this major sin, rather the, the greatest of sins, which is polytheism. So you find, the Ma'ash al as it says, the reason for that was mahabbat al-salihin. It was the love of, ri- of the righteous. Is the love of the righteous is something that is obligatory upon the Muslim to love the Salihin, to love the people of Tawheed because they are the awliya Allah. <coughs> they are the tr- they're friends of Allah or the people of Tawheed and the people of Sunnah, the people of Aqeedah. So not only do we love Allah, we, lo- we love who Allah loves. So the love of the righteous, who if, the, if they're truly righteous, is something that is from the religion, it has its place. So it started off with something of an affair that agrees with the religion. However, th- we talked about how the method of how they went about it was incorrect. <coughs> it was totally in contrast to what Allah legislated. So they came with an innovative practice, which is what? To bring those images and put them in those, those statues that were carved and bring remembrance or to revive or, re- or bring revivory love or to revive love. <coughs> revive love for them and also desiring to see their ghosts or what have you or see their shapes or to see their images what came as a result of it like we said something evil rather than the most wicked affair took place as a result of it but like we said in, the, in regards to this principle notice that falsehood can come in the name of truth in the beginning especially in speech as we talked about and you'll find that a there's no one from the people of falsehood, from, the, from whether they be, not even, even from the, the non-Muslims. You'll find that they always come with a statement that people gravitate towards, not realizing that something else is intended behind it. And the same thing with other, others from the deviant sects of the Muslims. You'll always, come, you'll always find that they come with something of the truth or something of what they call a shi'arat or some type of what they call uh, a shi'ar, a slogan, that's the word. Come up with some type of slogan so the people could gravitate towards. Either a slogan or bringing a statement that's generalized, not giving the proper details in it. For example, you'll find that from the ways of the people of bid'ah, 
for the people of falsehood is that they raise or they try to make widespread slogans. They raise what they call shi'arat. Shi'arat is like a slogan to have the people gravitate towards. For example, Alhamdulillah, you have to call his Hubala. Uh, oh, you want to <laughs> you want to stop? I started class already. We <laughs> should have did it before class. The Shia or the slogans that you'll find that some of the people falsehood that they use. For example, we don't blind follow anyone. You'll find that people use those type of statements that are what that gravitate, which is a, which is a slogan that some of the people falsehood that they utilize without giving the proper details, and it's a general statement also. We don't blind follow anyone. We don't blind follow anyone. Not realizing <coughs> that taqlid is of different categories, as we talked about before. So in order to have the people to rouse, to rouse them up or to stir up confusion and, and dissension amongst the people, you co they'll come with these famous slogans, or they'll come with something, for example, of general statements. Generalize it and the people will accept it. Thinking that that person is, actu is actually calling to the truth. As I discuss discussed last class, not last class, but maybe a couple of classes ago, the statement they will utilize, for example, <clears throat> we don't blind follow anyone. We don't blind follow anyone. We don't blind follow the scholars. Not realizing that this is a statement of truth, but was intended by a falsehood. In certain cases, especially, if the person generalizes the statement without giving the proper details in it. Because there's a type of taqlid that's highly recommended. And there's a type of taqlid that's wajib. And that type of taqlid is ittiba' is following the message of Allah. That taqlid is wajib. Following the sunnah and that type of taqlid in actuality is called ittiba' It's following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu That's wajib. So that's what I'm saying when a person gives us this slogan or these general type of words, the point of what we're trying to say is, Yama Ishul Ikhwa, is they bring statements of what? Truth. What's intended by it is falsehood. Or it's mixed with falsehood. <clears throat> so you'll find that there are a lot of those from the deviant sex. They're always going to come with something to bring something that what people will gravitate towards so they can accept their statement. So that's the reason why you have to be very familiar and keen on slogans that are used and are now circulated amongst the people in order for falsehood now to be what? To be acceptable. Another example of that, for ex you'll find, we don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is body parts. So say statements such as like that. You, like for example, Allah being above, you're not you're going to say that my Lord sits on a throne like a human being and all these other different types of words that they come and bring. And in actuality, if a person doesn't study Aqidah to Ahl Sunnah, and they hear these type of statements, they will accept it, thinking that it's correct, saying my Lord sits on the throne. First of all, Allah never said he sits. That's number one. You'll never find Kitab al-Sunnah that Allah yijlis. You'll never find in Kitab al-Sunnah that Allah sits. Allah said he's above the arsh. Allah says he's above. He never said he sits. And we know, even if you want to come from an argument, an intellectual argument, just because someone is above something doesn't mean he has to sit on it. <laughs> just because someone is above something does not necessitate that he has to be what? Physically sitting on it. If you affirm that for the birds as they fly over, and that's even for things that Allah created. They are above things, and at the same time, they're not sitting on it. The things from the creation that are above, such as the clouds, such as the moon, <laughs> and the other things that Allah has created, where it is above, and at the same time, it is not what? It's not, it's not actually physically sitting on something. So things can be above, and at the same time, it cannot be what? Sitting. But these are the type of slogans and statements you'll find at the people that they 
that they circulate amongst the people in order, to, in order to cause doubt, and it allows the people to gravitate towards it until they think it is something acceptable. And it's re in reality, it's all falsehood. So beware of the, of the slogans. For example, how can it's a lot of different types of slogans of people falsehood in the past. For example, even with, excuse me, I could even use that, which is the people of the Khawarij, and even, even in these days and times. They used to say, for example, there's no ruling except for Allah, which is a statement of truth. They'll say there was no ruling, there's no judge except Allah, which is the truth. However, they utilize it in order to what? Declare Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Sahaba, some of them to be kuffar, or to justify them to now go out and kill them. But notice that they use a, a statement of truth. So there's always going to be part, a person of, of falsehood. He's always going to come with a statement of truth in order for his, his falsehood to be what? Acceptable. So the people can what? Gravitate towards it. As a result of it, they accept it. And the people can be misled by it. You even find during the times and the days of Abu Musama in East Orange, New Jersey. He used to say this famous statement, let the sunnah go forth and don't stop it. Let the sunnah go forth and don't stop it. Let the sunnah go forth and don't stop it. That was a slogan that we used to constantly hear, especially back in the 90s. Let the sunnah go forth and don't stop it. Let the sunnah go forth and don't stop it. That was a slogan that was widely spread amongst the people. And like we said, that was from the signs of Hizbi, as we talked about before, that they try to use slogans or they try to use statements generalized without giving a proper detail in order to mislead the people. The point why we mention this, brothers and sisters, is to show that there's no person of falsehood except that they're going to bring something of the truth, whether it's an ayah or it's a hadith or whether it's a statement of the ulama in order to mislead you if you do not have the proper knowledge, if you do not have the proper principles in order to know how to refute and see what's behind the statement or what's being intended, then as a result of it, you could go astray. You could be easily what? Fooled. And you could be what? Tricked and falling into their what? Their treachery and their deviation as a result of it, you could go astray. So that's the reason why, Ya Ikhwa, know for sure that the example that the great Imam that he mentioned in the book is, a, is an excellent example of what we're saying. So notice he said what? He even gave an example about, we're still talking about the fifth matter. If you look in your book, fifth matter, not just looking at me. It's the fifth matter that he said that you'll find that the truth is mixed with falsehood. So, however, these people, as we discussed last class, what does it say? You look in your books, everyone. What does it say? They intended good. They intended good, meaning those from the, those who came before intended something good. And the later generation, as a result of it, they utilized that, that incorrect method in order now for what? Something to be, something to be utilized, which is wicked. For example, like we talked about, discussed before, the people who are practicing the mawlid or the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu especially for those who are ignorant, they intend good. But however, they did not what? Embark upon the method which is legislated. <coughs> As we talked about also, Ya Ma'ish al-Ikhwa, that these type of innovations you see the high or the great influence that it has upon the hearts of the people and how it could be decorated for the people who practice it. You'll find that the innovative practices does not increase one except in misguidance. And it will increase them in putting them far, far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's due to the hadith as we quote in, in every khutbah. The Prophet sallam, clearly mentioned and said, Kullu bid'atin dalala. That every innovative practice is a misguidance. And every misguidance is in the hellfire. As we talked about, Ya Ma'ish al Ikhwa, especially in, in previous classes, and that, inshallah, if I had the time, that one of the reasons why <coughs> one of the reasons why the previous religions are, were un, are still to this day unacceptable from Judaism and Christianity is because innovative practices crept into religion and changed it. So it became a reason for their religion becoming altered and distorted. One of the main reasons why it became altered and distorted was innovations. Innovations totally changed the legislation 
in which Allah sent down upon that particular prophet and messenger at that particular time until it became something totally in contrast and in opposition to what that prophet came or what he brought. So one of the main reasons why you'll find that a lot of those religions were unacceptable due to the fact of what crept in it of innovative practices and things that were newly introduced in the religion in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down with, without any authority. And you'll find that our ayat in the book of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this of why their religion is considered something of unacceptable due to the fact that it was altered and distorted and changed. Not only by the ignorant ones, but those who were even from their own, from their heads, from their own scholars, who changed it and incorporated something of their own opinion and something of their own input and changed the legislation of Allah. As we know, Allah clearly mentions about how they changed what everyone, they made haram, halal, halal, haram, and the people what? Followed them in it until they fell into a polytheism, which is called polytheism and legislation, as we'll talk about later. But the main thing of why we're mentioning this is we said, this is also brings to show and, and enlighten everyone of why bid'ah is considered the most evil of, evilest of affairs. Why? Due to all the different details we gave last class. Firstly, of the danger of it, of, for example, of, of a person being punished in hell as a result of it. Especially if he knows what he does is incorrect. And he knows that it is not acceptable with Allah based upon the text that Allah has made clear. There's some details in which we'll discuss, inshallah, about the, the actual intention, which I'll discuss in a minute, inshallah. طيب. For number one, as you'll find if you look in your books, it says that the action of the people of knowledge at that time, they wanted something. And they tended by a good, and they thought of those who came after them, excuse me, فَظَنَّ مَنْ بَعْتَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَرَادُوا بِهِ غَيْرًا so those who came after, of course, then they intended something other than that. They intended something wicked. We have too many examples of this which can't be enumerated or counted. As I said, for example, celebrating the message of Allah's birthday. <coughs> You'll find that there are people, they even try to use the ayah and the hadith. For example, a person would say, we celebrate the message of Allah's birthday due to the fact that the message of Allah said about fasting on the day of Monday, They'll say, for example, that is the day that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu that he mentioned said, ذَاكَ يَوْمٌ وَلِلْتُ فِيهِ وَبُعِدْتُ فِيهِ وَأُزِلَى عَلَيَّ فِيهِ وَكَانَ عَلَيَّ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ يَصُومُهُ مَعَ الْخَمِيسِ You'll find that they use a narration. If you, if you look to the evidences that they try to utilize to justify why they celebrate the Messenger of Allah's birthday, they say, for example, that the Messenger of Allah used to fast every Monday or Thursday. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that is the day I was born in and the day I was born in and the day that I was sent as a prophet and also it was the, the day in which revelation descended upon me. So he also used to fast it along with what? Thursdays we know, right everyone? Also they used the narration that every Monday and, and Thursday is the day in which that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed that the actions ascend to Allah. And he said that I will what? That I love that my actions are sent to Allah and I'm fasting. So these are some of the evidences that they use. Are these evidences for them or is it against them? It's against them. Why, everyone? Number one, you will never find any of these narrations of encouragement of celebrating his birthday. You'll never find it. Rather, it's just talking about what? Fasting. Not celebrating his birthday. And that is just a mere what? An act of worship. It has nothing to do with what? Practicing his birthday. Or celebrating his birthday. As we know, celebration of the Prophet Sallallahu birthday is totally opposite to what was mentioned in the narration. Narration says nothing, and if you look at it, there's nothing that indicates it, not from qareeb ala mid ba'id, not from far nor from near of justifying or legislating that the message of Allah's birthday should be what? Established. Also, we know, Ya Ma'ash al-Ikhwa, if it was something that was good, we know that the Sahaba would have been the fastest of those to practice it. 
And that's always something that you could utilize in the face of the people of deviation. If this was something that was good and that Allah loves, then the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi would have been the first to practice it. As they were the ones who Allah Tabari with Ta'ala described them as being the best of worshippers and those who loved him. And if that was the case, how could it be that this affair was hidden from all of them without any exception? And we find that totally what? far off, that none of the Sahaba knew about this affair. That's something that's what? Totally far off. That any of the Sahaba, that this affair, would, they were totally unaware that this affair of the, mes- of the birthday of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be legislated. As we know, Ya Ma'ash al-Ikhwat, if this was an affair that was established and known amongst the, message of the, amongst the time of the Messenger of Allah, it would have been a practice. It would have been something legislated, and at least a couple of the Sahaba would have been practicing it. But to, to indicate totally that this affair was something innovated is that none of the Sahaba practiced it. None of them did it, and none of them drew close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by it. Which to let you know that it's a affair that is what? Evil. And if it was something that truly was good, they, the Sahaba, would have what? They would have hastened towards practicing it, and they would have also what? They also would have preceded the people in what? In doing it. And despite of that, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never, pra- never encouraged them to practice or establish his birthday, nor did none of the Sahaba what? Practiced it during their time, nor did they pass that on to any of the Tabi'een. So none of the Tabi'een heard about it. So that was something that showed that it came in the later, in the later generation, which was something that was newly invented. So to draw close to Allah to be with the Alabadis, this matter is what? Rejected. So we also said, Ya Ma'ash al Ikhwah, why is this also considered evil? As we talked about before, let's just say, for example, that this matter did have an origin in the religion, for example. That it's obligatory just to restrict upon this affair due to the fact that all affairs of ibadah is tawqifiyah. As we said, all of the affairs of ibadah are all what? Affairs in which there's a text clearly establishing kitab and sunnah to indicate for one to practice. As we said that the origin in all affairs of worship is that everything's haram. Everything is haram until there's a text legislating that you can practice it. That is a qa'id and a principle that you have to memorize. That all al-asaf al-ibadat al-mana'. The origin in all affairs of worship that everything is unlawful. Everything is impermissible. Until you know there's a text for you to do it. You understand everyone? And all the affairs of the ibadat are what they call tawqifiyah. Tawqifiyah mean that a person does not practice it unless he finds the text clearly indicating he should what? He should do it. That is to show how important this matter is and the, and the severe magnitude of the one who falls into something that's in opposition to it. Due to the fact you'll find that Ahl Ilm lay down, that the origin in all ibadat is what? Everything is haram. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Tayyib. So the next, let's go to the sixth. The sixth is Tafsir al ayah The meaning of the ayah is Surah Nuh. Number six. <coughs> Tafsir the ayah and Surah Nuh, I think it's clear, alhamdulillah. Let's go to the seventh. The seventh is Jabilatul Adami fi kawn al-haq yanqusu fi qalbihi wal-ba'atil wal-ba'atil yazid, naam. He said that the natural disposition of the sons of Adam that the truth can become less in the hearts of an individual and falsehood, and falsehood can what? Can, incre- can increase. What does he mean by that, brothers? That Allah to be with Ta'ala, after a person's heart has been filled, of course we know, with falsehood. A person's heart can be incre- or being filled with falsehood. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows his blessing upon the servant by guiding him. Once the, the root of guidance has been implanted, then the guidance can grow and the falsehood becomes less. And even, it can even diminish to the point where there's nothing left of it. Such as what happened with what? With a lot of the Sahaba. Such as Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Such as Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Wa Khadib al-Walid. And even Abu Jahl's son, Ikrimah radiallahu anhu abda. Because a lot of people don't know that Ikrimah was the son of Abu Jahl. He was Muslim. He was a mu'min radiallahu anhu abda. So, no, they were upon, at one point in time, upon what? Upon falsehood. That falsehood was what? Was dominant in their hearts. That, when the revelation, when the Prophet ﷺ came, and when they accepted it, as we know, falsehood diminished and, and decreased, and what? And the truth augmented in their hearts and became strong. And this is what can happen to an individual when he env em embraces the truth. That falsehood can diminish. It become less the more the person increases in knowledge and the more that he in increases in implementing it. You'll find that the truth and the iman and also f the truth become strong and it dominates over falsehood, and it becomes less. It can become less and diminish until there's nothing left. As we gave examples of this before, as this has happened to some of the people of misguidance, as Abu al-Hasan al-Aj'ari. As I talked about Abu al-Hasan al-Aj'ari, as we said last class, or a couple of classes ago, he used to be Mu'tazili, he used to be for the Mu'tazila. He used to be from the deviant. I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit. You guys are cold? You cold? Yeah, I kind of feel it. If you look to this matter, the origin of insan, the origin of mankind, that the truth can what? Can diminish in his heart. And falsehood can what? Increase. The origin of man is what? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described him in two ayats. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the origin of mankind is that he's what? He's a dhalumun kafar. That he's what? The origin in insan is, is jahala. He's not known. It's jahal. It's ignorance. Jahal, ignorance. It's the origin of man. Is anyone born a uh, alim? So the origin of mankind is ignorance. He doesn't know. He doesn't have knowledge of, of anything. He has to learn. So the origin of man is what? It's jahal. It's ignorance. He has to set out to learn. The origin of mankind is dhul, is, is, a, is, is dhul and jahal. Is what? Is oppression and it's also ignorance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُمًا جَهُولًا That insan or the mankind took on the burden of carrying this duty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had what? commanded him to carry out. To carry the establishment of his worship. The point of the reference in the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah number 72 was to let you know that the origin of man is what? It's ignorance and oppression. So that a person we will find that say in the statements that the origin of everyone is that he's from Ahl Sunnah, that's, that's nonsense, that's ignorant. That's a statement of ignorance. I want everybody to be attentive to what I'm saying. 
The words that I say, brothers and sisters, I'm saying it for a reason. Because a lot of those best, if I'm around, or if something happened to me, if I was to die, a lot of the things that I'm saying in these classes, you'll find that it will all come to light. A lot of these things that I'm teaching you. As I've heard every type of nonsense for the years in this Dow, years. I've heard so much nonsense and seen so much nonsense. And so many things you could call as soon as you see it. Easy as the sun in the sky. Due to the fact that it's happened so many times. <laughs> it's like a doctor that's had a thousand cases. As soon as he sees it, he knows what's going on. And he knows what law knows best what's going to end up. You'll find there are people out there that say the statement that the origin of the Muslim is that he's from Ahl Sunnah. Is this correct? It's not wrong. It's not correct. The origin of a Muslim is not from Ahl Sunnah. The origin of mankind is that he's, ig he's ignorant. He's violent. He's majhul. He's jahil. He's ignorant. And he's also what? And he's also oppression, oppressor of himself. That's the origin of mankind. The origin of man is dhulm. Is dhulm and jahil. Is what? It's oppression. And it's ignorance. It's oppression and it's ignorance. That's the origin of mankind. <clears throat> so we say for a person that's not known, he's not known. We say, oh, he's, uh, he's the origin of every human being. He's from Ahl Sunnah. That's, not, that's incorrect. That's a statement of ignorance itself. And there's no delay for that. Do not say that a person, the origin of him is Ahl Sunnah. Every individual that becomes Muslim, he's the origin of his Ahl Sunnah. Every person is in his origin. Every Muslim is from Ahl Sunnah. That's a kind of speech that's, old, that's far off. The origin of mankind is what? Is that he's ignorant and it's also oppression. Until it is known who he is and it's established who he is, what his inclination is. So you'll find that, that's, that Ahl Sunnah, although even with the great Imam Ibn Uthaymin that he mentioned says, he said that the origin of man is that he's discussed with two characteristics. He said, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَظَلُومٌ كَفَّارٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the mankind is zalum. He's a zalim. Origin of him is oppression. And he's also what? Kafar. You'll find that you, usually when he comes or something of the truth comes to him and he thinks he's already knows it, usually he will make enmity with it. You'll find there's a statement of the salaf they used to say, مَنْ جَهِلَ شَيْئًا فَإِنَّهُ يَعَادِي مَنْ يَجْهَلُ شَيْءٍ Oh, he says, مَنْ جَهِلَ شَيْءٍ فَإِنَّهُ يُعَادِي That's the statement, alhamdulillah. Whoever is ignorant of something, then he will make enmity with it, usually. <laughs> if you're ignorant of something, you will make enmity with it. You understand what I'm saying, everyone? Usually if a person is ignorant of something, he makes it his enemy. Until he ascertains the truth and reads it thoroughly and attains the correct information and the authentic information about an affair, then it becomes clear. But the origin of man is that he's oppressive of himself and he's also what? He's ignorant. So those are the two descriptions to show that that's the origin of man. For if Allah to bring ta'ala now bestows his ni'mah, his blessing upon the servant of faith and the correct belief, and righteous actions, then he will remove himself from these two characteristics. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Are you guys writing this down? Are you guys writing this down? So the origin of man and the human being is that it's what? It's, an oppre it's oppression and it's also ignorance. And the only way that he raises these de descriptions off of himself is by embracing the correct belief and working righteous actions. That's as a result of it when he embraces these affairs, he will raise all these what? These condemned characteristics off of himself. He will remove these characteristics off of himself by the correct faith and also by righteous actions. You'll find that comes in Surah Tateen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقَنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tateen, He says, We have created mankind in the best what? In the best formation, best taqweem. Then we sent him down and being the lowliest of low, 
What does what did Allah Taala mean by that? Meaning, due to his origin as a human being of not having knowledge and being ignorant, and then the origin of him is oppression. Then he became, as a result of those characteristics, from the lowest of those who are what lowly. A person is lowly if he is ignorant and he does not set out to learn. And we know and we see the results of ignorance and how it can what? It can make a person truly look what? Deficient. How ignorance can make a person and manifest to be very what? Very what? Dispraiseworthy. Am I right or wrong? That's in any affair from the affairs of life. Anybody that walks in an affair and in, in, in embark upon a matter that they truly don't know what they're doing, it makes them look foolish, and it makes them look what? It's praiseworthy. What's praiseworthy and what decorates a person is when they have what? When they have knowledge. That's what decorates an individual. When you see that they have ilm. How many do we see when a person speaks a knowledge, it looks what? It's very de it makes their speech and what they're saying be what? Decorated. And it makes it look what? It makes it look embellished if, if they are disseminating the truth, of course. But however, if a person speaks upon knowledge and they conduct in a manner that's based upon knowledge, it decorates the individual. But when a person is just speaking pure ignorance, it makes them and their level become very what? Humiliating in the eyes of the people. Especially when a person is, speaks upon pure, absolute, unadulterated ignorance that's clear as the sun in the sky for everyone to see. So you find that Allah Taala says in Surah sort of teen, He says, then we made and returned man back to the lowest of lowly. Why? What, does he mean? what do we mean by that in the ayah of Surah Tatin? Due to the fact of him possessing these two qualities of ignorance and oppression. Then Allah Taala says, those who will be raised of not considered from the lowliest of lowly, except those who believe and do righteous action. So now a person to remove himself from being from the low, lowliest of lowly, is those who embrace the revelation of Allah and do righteous actions. Then, as a result of it, he removed himself from those two characteristics that Allah Taala described. The servant, if he possesses them, he will be from the lowliest of lowly. How does he take himself out of that state based upon what? <laughs> Except those who believe, meaning they embrace the proper belief system and also work diligence in righteous what? Righteous actions. But notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he, we return man after he was brought into this existence, after he was created in the best state. Meaning that we gave man to know and give him all the tools that he, what he needs to know and to embrace and to understand and to grasp and, ha and, and comprehend what is correct and what's the, and, and a tool to utilize what's falsehood or what's truth. And that is made, and we laid that out for him to have the what? The tools to distinguish it. Now it's upon him to set out for it and to try to attain it to the best of his ability. In order to raise himself out of those, the pit or the swamp of, like we said, or the dispraiseworthy state of being from those who are ignorant and the origin in them, being in the state of ignorance and oppression, he has to embrace what is correct and work righteousness. That's the reason why we will find Yama Ishul Ikhwa. That a person, when he embraces the truth, as the truth can be what? Augmented and increased. Whereas falsehood can what? Decrease. As long as he's embarking upon learning the ilm of the knowledge and also putting it to practice. That the knowledge becomes increased, whereas the falsehood becomes suppressed. And it decreases. As it happened with, like we said some of the Sahaba from, from Khad al-Walid and Umar al-Khattab and also Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl. Also from those from the Salaf who are upon falsehood, who from the great Imam Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari, not from the Salaf, but we would say, excuse me, from the scholars of the past, excuse me, everyone, from the scholars of the past. From some of the scholars of the past who are upon falsehood, what happened to Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari? As we talked about before, he was Mu'tazili. He was upon the way of the Mu'tazila. Then he became from the Kullabiya. Then he embraced the Aqeed of Ahl Sunnah. Until the falsehood that he used to believe became suppressed. And it became removed. 
and the truth in his heart became what? Increased. Same thing what happened with Shaykh, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn al-Qayyim. As Ibn al-Qayyim used to be Sufi. Now, Ibn al-Qayyim used to be Sufi. As a lot of people don't know that. Ibn al-Qayyim used to be Sufi. Some people probably say, is that true? Yes, it's true. <laughs> Ibn al-Qayyim used to be Sufi. There's a book, and I think it's... Uh, I think it's, in, it's either in Kitab al-Ruh or it's in Fawaid. It's either in Fawaid or Tariq al-Hijratayn. It's one of, the book, one of the two books. Ibn al-Qayyim says, he said, all praise is due to the Allah, to the one who saved me from the madhab of my, of my people. But he said a statement like that. From the madhab of, my, of his people. And the people that, of what they were upon during his time was Sufiya. So he said that the way of his people he said, all praise is due to Allah, the, the one who saved me from what they were upon. And we know that the majority of the people that was around him at the time were, Sufi, were Sufis. So Ibn al-Qayyim, Allah ta'ala, bestowed his blessing upon the great Imam by guiding him at the hands of Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah. Until he came from being someone who was from the, considered from the Sufis to the one who's considered the greatest of the uh, im of this religion of these days and times. So you'll find that falsehood can what? It can be dominant, and when truth comes, then it will what? It will shun it, suppress it, until it can be what? Totally, totally what? Annihilate it to the point where nothing is left of it, until the haq becomes dominant. But the only way that one can achieve that is by setting out to attain ilm and also working righteousness. That's the only way one can suppress his what? The bathroom. A lot of people don't think, or a lot of people, some people think, once truth is implanted in the heart of the individual, that falsehood is totally what? Eradicated. No. The origin of the root of faith has been implanted. But now it's upon you to fertilize it. <laughs> and the fertilization only comes with the what? With the beneficial knowledge. And it comes with the what? With the righteous actions. That's it. The seed of Iman is based upon the choice of which you what? Accept it. Now you have to what? You have to allow, let, allow that seed to what? To be fertilized so it can grow and it can increase and the evilness that is in you can be suppressed. And the falsehood that you used to be upon can be what? Alleviated. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? So that's what we say in regards to what? That the origin of Adam, and I'm going to say this last one, benefit again. The origin of Adam and the children of Adam, like we said, is oppression and ignorance. And not that everyone, or every, the origin of every Muslim is he's from Ahl Sunnah. The origin of every Muslim is from Ahl Sunnah? That's Ba'id. The origin of mankind, of him being a man, is ignorance and oppression. And the only way you can erase those characteristics off of him is by beneficial knowledge and also working righteous actions. Also, likewise, like we said, how the truth can be increased, whereas falsehood can what? Decrease. Also the opposite. Also the opposite. That if one is not careful, how falsehood can increase, and then what? And truth can also, likewise, diminish. It can what? It can also become weak if you're not careful, especially if you take knowledge from the wrong people. Oh, we already went over that. Moving on to the eighth. He said, فيه شاهد لما نقل عن السلف أن البدع سبب الكفر. This is another affair, which is what? I'm going to have to ask you to start sitting here. I'm going to ask you to start saying. <laughs> I, I don't leave him. I said he might have to start sitting here. So the eighth is what? What's the eighth? Ah. This is another affair that is very what? Important. That the great Imam that he mentioned. He saw also what is derived from these uh, narrations of what happened with the people of Nuh. فِيهِ شَاهِدٌ لِمَا نُقِلَ عَنِ السَّلَفِ أَنَ الْبِرَعْ سَبَبُ الْكُفْرِ سَبَبُ الْكُفْرِ He says, in it, is the testimony 
of what has been conveyed upon a salaf, that innovation is the reason for disbelief. Ah, innovation is a reason for disbelief. Is the reason for disbelief as far as the major disbelief? Of course. So that the people of knowledge have said, as we know, that disbelief has numerous causes. From them is innovations. Innovations can lead you to the road of disbelief. I'll say it again. Innovated innovations or newly invented matters or newly invented practices that are incorporated in the religion that has no connection with it except due to the fact that one innovated or came with something unprecedented that was not during the time of the message of Allah alayhi salatu salam can lead you to the road of disbelief. <coughs> can lead you to the road of what? Of disbelief. In most cases that I have seen, if not, a lot of people who are followers of, of the people of innovations, you'll find that a lot of their followers, either some of them left the fold of Islam, left the fold of Islam, or they're just a Muslim by, by what they call by custom. Not because they truly embrace the pure aqidah to know what their upon of surety is the truth. But it became just something customary. Do people understand where I'm coming from? It's just a custom. And you will even find that they agree with statements of kufr, where they have now, I agree with you, yeah, I don't believe that, for example, uh, polygyny is not for the religion. I, I apologize that my religion says that. I apologize for that. Or, for example, I apologize for certain affairs and what Allah has said. I apologize for that. So now you'll find that a person, especially in, involved in practicing innovative practices, what comes as a result of it, as we know, that bid'ah, that innovations brings about doubt in the religion. Innovation in a religion brings doubt. It will bring doubt, innovative practices, and the origin of it goes back to the belief system. That innovation will bring some type of doubt and corrupt your ideology, your belief system. There's no one who you'll find that the Salaf used to say who's deserving of apostating. They will say at the list is the people of, of, of innovation. As they are the ones who are, the, are subjected to deviation and apostation the most. Due to the fact that a majority of them had not the embrace the light of Tawheed had not been well deep-rooted in their hearts. Once that, had, that foundation has not been deeply rooted, that has not been deep-rooted in their hearts, you'll find what comes as a result of it is more likely that that, what, that light they might have gained will be what? Wiped out. Due to the fact that the origin of what illuminates the light has not been what? Deeply rooted inside of themselves. So you'll find that a shubha or a different type of ambiguity or doubtful matter can come and totally now come as a result of it, some type of deviation. You'll find that some of the people, especially from the Sufis who are upon that way, who embarked upon worshiping the dead, until I have even seen with my own eyes people who are engrossed in, in Sufiya, and they came back being very confused due to the fact of what they witnessed or seen of certain things that they seen of what was considered extremely strange until it caused some doubt in the religion. To see someone now in a masjid and they're now dancing around, and some of the Sufis do this, dancing in a circle in a circle until the point where they're now chanting and they're also raising their voices and singing. And they're also to the point where they start dancing in the masjid. And so a person that now does this and sees this a person will say, what's the difference between us and the Christians? Except that this, you just describe yourself as being Muslim. Except that this is the ways in which can lead down a road in which can cause some doubt. 
And you would think that now you would come as a result of it, some type of deviation, even the possible way of even apostation. You apostate totally. I've seen it happen to a lot of people due to the fact that either they are upon a different deviant sect, either they were from the sex, from the deviant sex, especially the shubha, for example, that Allah Ta'ala is not above the heavens, or that Allah Ta'ala, he does not have body parts, as they say. Well, they don't believe that Allah has a face, Allah Ta'ala does not have, that he does not have, he does not have those two hands that befit him, or the face that befits him, or that Allah Ta'ala, that eyes has befit him. They deny this. What comes as a result of it, you'll find a lot of people who embrace these type of ideologies, either they deviate or they apostate. Why? Because the, the origin of these beliefs, it causes doubt in your religion. It'll cause doubt. If you embrace upon these type of beliefs and you listen to it, it will cause some type of doubt. It will cause you now as a reason for your, for your apostation if you're not careful. And you do not seek knowledge or you, re, or you do not seek that that shubha or that ambiguity be removed from your heart by someone from a person of knowledge. Because the people of knowledge are the only ones that can remove that ambiguity from your heart if you now what? If you read it. That's the reason why we generally tell the people to stay away from the people of innovations. Because they'll say a statement as a result of it due to your lack of knowledge in that affair. They'll cause some type of what? Deviation to fall in your heart. And even it could be a reason for you apostating. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Is it clear what I'm saying? That's the reason why we said that innovations is, can lead you to the road of kufr. It can lead you to the road of disbelief. I've he seen this happen to so many people. I have seen hundreds of people deviate and some of them apostate because of some type of innovative practice that they embraced and they embarked upon practicing. Deviated. Not only deviated, or they what? Apostated. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? So now this is to show that innovations is not something that's what? Easy. As a result of it, it can what? It can lead you down a road of kufr. Also, likewise, the, what can also lead you to the road of kufr is sin. So not only do we say bid'ah can lead you to disbelief, sins can also lead you to, the dis to disbelief. Sins. Sins can lead you to disbelief. Are you listening or are you writing this down? Are you listening or are you writing it down? I said, number one, innovations can lead you to what? Disbelief. Likewise, sins can also lead you to what? To disbelief. Sins can also lead you, as they say, barida tul kufr. It's what can lead you to disbelief. Sins can lead you to the role of disbelief. Also, likewise, the minor sins. If one does not refrain from doing it until it accumulates, accumulates to the point where what? It would become like a mountain to the point where it could also be a reason to lead you down a road of deviance and disbelief if one is not careful. So three things that could be a reason for kufr. Either what? Either, number one, innovations. Innovations in the belief system and innovations in actions. Could put a seal over your heart, and Allah to with the as a result of it, that seal that Allah has put on the one's heart, one could be led astray by it. His insight could be removed. And when we say insight, we don't mean sight of the eyes. We mean insight of the heart. The insight of the heart is the greatest insight. The insight where you can dis the distinguish between truth and falsehood. That is the greatest insight. Where you can distinguish between what is truth and what is falsehood. And if Allah grants you that furqan, that is the greatest gift that Allah has bestowed upon the servant. But that furqan or that criteria that's, in that's instilled in the heart of the ibad of the abd can be wiped out if he's not careful. What can wipe it out is innovations. 
innovations and innovative practices and beliefs can wipe it out. Wipe out that criteria and that affair in which you can distinguish between truth and falsehood. It can be moved, removed and wiped out. Or it can what? Be re rendered weak if you're not careful. Especially if you embark upon innovations. And especially if you embark upon sins. And especially if you start to now deem to be minor sins to be nothing at all. Until the point where you start to, to commit it, until it accumulates, until it becomes bigger than a mountain. For you'll find that the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, which comes to Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet وسلم, had mentioned upon, or mentioned all these affairs, all of them. The hadith of Hudayfa, radiallahu anhu. Where the Prophet وسلم, mentioned it said, تُعْرَضُ الْفَتَنْ عَلَى الْقُلُوبِ كَعْرَضِ الْحَصِيرِ عُودًا عُودًا فَأَيُّ قَلْبٍ أُنْكِرَهَا نُكِتَ فِيهِ نُكِتَ فِيهِ نُكْتَةٌ سَوْدَاء Excuse me. فَأَيُّ قَلْبٍ أُشْرِبَهَا نُكِتَ فِيهِ نُكِتَ فِيهِ نُكْتَةٌ سوداء وأي قلب أنكرها نكت فيه نكتة بيضاء حتى تصير على قلبين أبي مثل الصفا فلا لا تضره فتن فلا تضره الفتنة ما دامت السماوات والأرض والآخر مربادك الكوز مجخيا لا يعرف معروفا ولا ينكر منكرا إلا ما أشب من هوا وده حديث حذيفة رضي الله عنه the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said that trials and tribulations are constantly being shown to the hearts of the servants. Constantly. Hadith, this is Sahih Muslim. He said, Fitan is always being shown to the hearts of the servants. Daily. Ka'arud al-Hasiri, Udan, Udan. Just as the leaves that during the time of the Prophet, they used to lay, lay on things called. Hasir. Hasir is like a type of leaf that used to leave like a like a little imprint on it, on person's back, like a little mark on his body if he, he got up from it. Like you know how you lay on something that leaves a print on your body or what have you if you get up from it or whatever. Like you lay on your hand for a long time and like leave a print on your hand or a red mark. He said that these fitan is constantly being shown to a person in this manner. Constantly. It's be, your heart is being expo exposed to all different types of Trials and tribulations. That can what? That can be a re reason for it being rendered weak, or it could be a reason for it deviating. So the Prophet said, فَأَيُّ قَلْبٍ أُشْرِبَهَا نُكِتَ فِيهِ نُكْتَةٌ سَوْدَى So then he said, any heart that, that absorbs that evil, that absorbs it, whether it be of ambiguities, or desires, or sins, or innovations, or minor sins, it will be put on his heart a black dot. It will be put on his heart a nukita fihi nukta tun soda. Wa ayyu qalban an karaha nukita fihi nukta tun bayda. And any heart that rejects this fitan, it will be put on his heart a white dot. Until the heart becomes like two hearts. One will be pure, meaning those who reject all these type of affairs. Constantly fighting himself from rejecting all types of falsehood. Rejecting corrupt ideologies and beliefs and, and detesting sin and making tawbah to Allah, tabarakah wa ta'ala, and returning to the truth. He says... One will be white, meaning one heart will be white, abiyad mil safa, yani al hajr al amlas, like that smooth rock. And fitan, trials and tribulations won't harm it as long as the heavens and the earth exist. Meaning the person that's constantly, constantly fighting and in the struggle with himself to fight off all these different types of exposure, of trials and tribulations, of doubtful matters, of doubtful matters, and of sins and minor sins. Because we know that the human being is constantly in the sira'a. He's constantly in the struggle with himself. Every day. 
Is that the first one or the second one? Sorry. That the human being is constantly in a struggle with himself. From the time he wake up, like, wakes up for Fajr, for the time he puts his head back on the pillow. The human being is constantly in a struggle, either fighting, fighting his enemy, which is the enemy, firstly, of himself. The enemy of himself. Then the enemy of who he ca- does not see, who's the enemy of his shaitan, who Allah has appointed to all of us to test us by. And the enemy of dealing with regular human beings on a daily basis is a fitna. And fi- fitna of dealing with your f- for your spouse or your family or your children and people in general. All these things are constantly that uh, uh, the human being is constantly in a fight with, in a struggle with. For the time he wakes up in the morning, for the time he lay, puts his head back in the p- on his pillow at night, he's in a struggle on a daily basis. For verily you'll find that the Prophet said that every person now, that individual who fights and rejects this evil, he's struggling with himself, fighting those different ambiguities and those doubtful matters, fighting those sins that are constantly being what? Exposed, that his heart is being exposed to. Fighting also even the minor sins that people sometimes, they are very lackadaisical and what? looking at its magnitude. For find that the person that he rejects it, and even if he falls into it, he makes proper toba. As we know, another narration that the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned is said, that any abd, that he commits a sin, that if what? He says, nuki tafihi nuktatun soda, he will be implanted upon his heart a black dot. فَإِذَا تَابَ مِنْهَا as we know, the other narration of the Prophet gave another detail that he said that if the person makes tawbah and he returns back to the truth and he also now makes tawbah to his Lord with all the conditions, of course, and he makes istighfar, he says his heart will be polished and it will become white and pure again. So that all confirms the hadith of Hudayfa, which is to show what, everyone? That if this person constantly rejects falsehood and he constantly rejects all these different types of sins that his heart, heart is constantly being exposed to on a daily basis, constantly struggling and constantly fighting it off and warding it off his heart to the best of his ability to the point where if he does even slip, that he returns back to what is correct and he returns back to his Lord and he makes toba that his heart will remain what? In a state of purity. As long as the heavens and the earth exist. Meaning, the meaning of all this, brothers, is that Allah Ta'ala will give you tawfiq still to love the tawheed of Allah. And he will still also allow you to love the sunnah. And he will also allow you to love obedience. He will instill that in your heart, and that's what will make your heart white. Will give that whiteness to your heart is that Allah will keep your heart intact where you will love the tawheed of Allah. You write this down or you listen? Who's your sister? You, you sick today? Hey, sick today. Oh, Camden's writing it down. Jay, see if you can get it from Camden later. You need tissue? You do look sick. Matter of fact, I do. Uh, I, have, I have some oh, soft. I have some uh, shafaqa sympathy for you today. Yeah, he do, he don't look good. He truly doesn't look good. You don't look good. You don't. You ain't got to Maybe you stay home if you were sick. Tayyip. So as we said, if the person now is in this struggle and he rejects all these matters, he rejects disbelief, he rejects shirk, he rejects and struggles and fights it, and fights the also the, ma- the major sins and the minor. Allah Ta'ala by his tawfiq, he will allow his heart to remain intact, where he will keep the love of, the, of his tawheed in his heart, in the, in the heart of the slave, of course, in the heart of the servant. That love for Tawheed will remain intact. 
And that love for the sunnah will remain what? Intact and protected. And that love for obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also what? Remain intact. That is how your heart will remain what? White and pure. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Love of the monotheism, love of its people, love of the sunnah, love of its people, love of obedience, and love of its people. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Is it clear? The Prophet said, أَبْيَضْ مِثْلِ الصَّفَى فَلَا تَدُرُّهُ الْفِتْنَةِ مَا دَامَتِ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ Then he said, وَالْآخِرُ مُرْبَادِ كَالْكُوزِ مُجَخِّيًا لَا يَعْرِفُ مُنْكِرًا لَا يَعْرِفُ مَعْرُوفًا لَا يَعْرِفُ مَعْرُوفًا وَلَا يُنْكِرُ مُنْكِرًا إِلَّا مَا أُشِبَ مِنْ هَوَى Then the Prophet said the opposite. He said the person who their heart has been what? Has been now misguided. Misguided because of what? Because of what we mentioned in here. Misguided because of desires. Uh, uh, excuse me. Because of ambiguities and doubtful matters and innovations. Where you now start to love it and your heart accepts it. Your heart starts to love it and it accepts it. Until it will be put on your heart a black dot. Especially if the person's upon sins and major sins. Every time the person commits the major sin, the Prophet ﷺ said, what? It will be put on his heart, a black dot. So the one is akhiru murbad. Kilkuz mujakhiyan. He says it's like the upside flower that sits up like this. It would spread out. So if you pour anything into it, it holds it. Holds it. It's like it's been reversed. So now anything of those matters that you do not fight off, and you do, do, you, and that you do not try to ward off, and take away, remove from yourself, and put forth that struggle. Rather, you are now sticking your head out to accept it. All those matters that we told and warned from, and informed the people of, your heart will absorb it like a sponge. What will come as a result of it, like we said, either the black dots will override your heart until you what? Until it suppressed it now. It totally dominates the heart, which will be a reason for your what? Either your deviance or your apostation. So the deviance and apostation will either came as a result, as we know, of innovation. And, and of it being nullified from its origin, which is of Kufr and Shirk. We can nullify it totally. But innovations can also, likewise, be a main reason for why your heart will become black and be corrupted. And also, likewise, the major sins and the minor ones, if one is not careful. So the Prophet Sallallahu had mentioned and said, in the last part of the Hadith of Hudayfa, he said, وَالْآخِرُ مُرْبَادٍ I just said it. وَالْآخِرُ مُرْبَادٍ كَالْكُوزِ مُجَخِّيًا وَالْآخِرُ مُرْبَادٍ كَالْكُوزِ مُجَخِّيًا Now listen what the Prophet Sallallahu said, the last description of it. He said, لَا يَعْرِفُ مَعْرُوفًا وَلَا يُنْكِرُ مُنْكَرًا إِلَّا مَا أُشِبَ مِنْ هَوَى he said he will not be able to know what truly is good. It was considered tawheed. It was considered sunnah. It was considered obedience. He will not know. He will lose that. His affairs will be switched. He will not know any good, nor will he know any evil. He will not know and deem to be what? Know what is evil. Or he will not, repre excuse me, he will not reprimand or forbid any evil, except what is absorbed in his heart, what agrees with his desires. What is the Prophet of Allah saying here? Saying that these affairs of innovation, and these affairs likewise of sins, even minor sins, 
could be a reason of why your heart could be flipped until you will start to need now. You will think that the affairs will be mentioned in the first heart of it being pure. Your heart now is corrupted. So now the affairs of Tawheed, of monotheism, is switched. Now the Tawheed has been removed from your heart. The love for it has been uh, removed from your heart and the love of innovation and, and, de and deviation and disbelief has been put in your heart now. The love for it. The love for it and, the, and also likewise what? The desire to want it. So the love of the Tawheed of Allah has been removed and now your heart has now absorbed what is what? Love for disbelief and love for what is incorrect and love of shirk and kufr and innovation. So Allah switched it for you loving Tawheed to now you loving what? Shirk and kufr, and in some situations, even bid'ah. So those affairs have been switched. And also likewise, instead of you loving the sunnah, you will also find that the people now has been switched. The love of the sunnah has been removed until you now love what? Innovation. And also you loving now sins. It's been removed for the, dis the love, you should love for obedience of Allah. Now you love what? You love disobedience. Everything has been switched upon you now. So now you think that Tawheed is shirk, and shirk is Tawheed. You'll also start to think that Sunnah is bid'ah, and bid'ah is Sunnah. You'll also start to think that obedience is disobedience, and disobedience is obedience. Everything has been switched. That's the reason why you'll find that the Salaf used to say in a profound statement, فَإِنَّ الضَّلَالَ كُلَّ الضَّلَالَ إِن تَعْرِفُ مَا كُنْتَ تُنْكِرْ وَتُنْكِرُ مَا كُنْتَ تَعْرِفْ وَإِيَّاكَ وَتَلَوَّ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ دِينَ اللَّهِ وَاحِدْ So know, ya ma'ish al-ikhwa, the statement that is clear from the Salaf, that they say misguidance, unadulterated, clear misguidance is what? What is it? He said, that which you used to find of uprightness and tawheed and sunnah and what was correct yesterday, tomorrow you, f you find it to be what? Shirk and bid'ah and also you deem that now to be what? Disbelief now to tomorrow. What you used to find to be tawheed yesterday, you say now that today it's now kufr. That's evil. That you worshiping Allah alone, that's evil. And what you used to find yesterday, you used to say this was, this was sunnah, yesterday. That's the sunnah. Steadfast upon it. Tomorrow you say that now that that's evil. The people practicing the sunnah, that's evil. And also likewise, you saying that, that yes, let yesterday you used to deem and find that listening to music and having girlfriends or intoxicating yourself or doing and looking at things and hearing things that's displeasing to Allah, used to deem that to be what? Obedience, you find that now today that to be what? Disobedience. Your affairs have been switched. Also in which you used to find yesterday. Who used to speak ill about yesterday? You, speak, you praise them now today. Used to make, used to speak good about Sheikh Abir yesterday. Now you find today, you speak it ill about Sheikh Abir. Yesterday you used to speak good about Sheikh Saleh Fouzan. Now today you're speaking ill of Sheikh Saleh Fouzan. Yesterday you used to what? You used to love the people of the Sunnah. And you used to what? Be love being around them. You used to like the Salafi Masajid. Now today you start saying they're the most evilest people. I never found any good of them. This is what the Salaf used to say, saying this is unadulterated, clear misguidance. Yesterday which you used to find good, you deem it to be evil today. Used to say that the Salafis, mashallah, the people of Sunnah, the people of Tawheed, they are the people of the Sunnah, the people of German Tam Masjid, the people of some other Masjid, so and so Masjid, Masjid Muhammad Abdul Wahab. These brothers are known to be upon the Sunnah. Now, today, you say they are people of misguidance and what people of error. Everything has been switched upon you now. Now, you start to praise people yesterday who you used to dispraise. Yesterday, you used to speak ill about Shadi Muhammad. Yesterday used to speak ill about Tahir Wyatt. Yesterday used to speak ill about Muhammad Munir. Yesterday used to speak ill about all these individuals who are clearly misguiding people. Clears the sun in the sky without any shadow of a doubt. And I have yaqeen in that 
and no one should waste their time. And this is to the people of the truth. And the people of the truth already know this. And this is a message that's clearly to the people of other bit. Don't come to me arguing with these people because you're going to waste your time. These people are clear upon this guidance. And my message is to people yesterday who used to find all these people used to talk about them so bad. Now today you could you they praise every single last one of them. Know that everything I've been saying about for the past half an hour applies on you. All of your affairs have become switched until now that which is what? Guidance become misguidance to you. Now they're misguidance and one day you deem it to be misguidance now tomorrow. And what used to be misguidance to you yesterday, you deem it to be guidance today. That is an affair to let you know that Allah Ta'ala has switched your heart. Where now misguidance has what? has suppressed your heart and has even what? Polluted it. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? What you used to deem a fine. For example, yesterday, and this is there even to those from Tahir Wai, Shadim, Muhammad, and all those other people. And this is also applies to you. Yesterday, you used to be, speak ill about the Sufis. Yesterday, you used to talk bad about the Ikhwanis. Yesterday, for years ago, we used to hear these statements from you. Totally now, it's changed. You now speak ill of the people of the Sunnah, and you start to praise the people of innovations. And you start to now find excuses for them by saying, oh, they're ignorant people. They're people of ignorance. We have to have gentleness with them, echi. We have to take our time with them. Yeah, echi, we can see through your nonsense the reason why you're making all excuses for them, because they have some money that they give to you, because you have a weakness for the dollar. It's open and shut. That's the reason why we know you are making excuses for them. But you used to talk bad about the Sufis yesterday, Muhammad Munir, because I remember the day you used to speak ill about them. Tahir Wyatt, the same thing. You used to speak ill about the Sufis. Yesterday in the 90s, you used to speak ill about the Sufis. You used to speak ill about the Ikhwanis. You used to speak ill about these people. Now today, you with them. Clear guidance upon clear misguidance. Yesterday, which you used to find to be good, now you find it to be evil. And what you used to find evil back then, you find it good now. That's absolute, unadulterated, clear misguidance. And it's happened to you. May Allah keep us protected. Yesterday, I used to hear these statements from you. Yesterday, I you dog the Sufis back in the 90s. You used to dog the Ikhwanis. You used to dog Yasser Qadri. You used to dog him. You used to talk ill about him. Now it's switched. Switched it now. Now he praises them now. Sufis, all they're ignorant. Ikhwanis, all they're ignorant. All the Ikhwanis, all they're ignorant. All those people down 15th Street, ignorant. Yeah, actually, you got to take your time. Hey, but why is your tongue so, so moist? For what? The Salafi is so bad. And the awliya of the law and the awliya who are the son and the people of Tawheed and those who's calling to it. Your tongue is easy to lash out on it. And your war that you now have made is open and shut for the people to see that you make upon them daily, either directly or indirectly. To let you know clearly that your palm is guidance. Because these used to be your statements yesterday and now today they totally in contrast to what you're upon today. That's the reason why you'll find them Abu al-Hasan Ma'nibi and Ali al-Halabi, who is the principles that you're upon or who you're practicing, and Ibrahim al-Rahili, which you're practicing today, you'll find that that, what they used their practicing, they used to find, when they, you'll find that the ulama, when they refuted them, they used to compare their statements of how they were yesterday to about today. You'll say, for example, Ali Halabi contradicts Ali Halabi. So you say, what do they mean by, what do they mean by that? Meaning that they used to take his statements from what he used to say in old times, and compare, to, compare them to today and find there's a major, major what? Contradiction. To show there's as if two people are talking. Two different people. The Ali Halabi of the past is not the Ali Halabi today. It's like two separate individuals speaking. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Also, likewise. Now, as far as Abu Hassan Madibi, he was always shut up. But at any rate, in regards to some of those other people, you'll find statements of how they used to speak yesterday totally contradicted to how they used to they speak today. It's like two different people talking to let you know that something happened where something was switched. Something switched, something happened. Where Allah knows best, your heart was what? Was corrupted. And this is also to a message to those who follow them. You used to go to Germantown, you used to go to Masajid, to the Sunnah. Now look where you at. And don't try to come to me saying you love me. That's not going to make me have anything to change towards my will and my butt off for you. Just because you have a personal love for me to try to make me think that I'm now going to agree with what you're doing, I separate myself from you until you make Tawbah to Allah. And that's how every Sadafi should be. 
Is it clear? Okay, I'll go. Is it clear? Jake. We'll stop here. طيب هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك anything else about the class brothers and sisters so the last thing that we stopped on was what everyone that the shahid is that the salaf that bid'ah can lead you down the road of what it can lead you down the road of innovations jay we'll stop here any questions oh the hadith so to teen, uh, the last is in a so the Jews are the second ayah, second or the third. So Mara did an ayah about Surah to teen, it's the second or the third ayah. The Surah to teen. You talk about Surah to teen or you talk about something else? You talk about something else? Uh-huh. Oh, it could be low. Okay. G. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's it. So to T. Anything else, brothers? Sis brothers. Uh, is it all? Yeah, I have to keep turning it off. <laughs>